Hello, everyone, and welcome. Tonight, we're going to do Drag for Beginners with the most amazing Brunhilde and Chantel. Hi. Woo! I would like to welcome Hi. everyone who's sitting inside the tent and everyone who's following along at home. I would just like to say that this is being taped live, so if you don't want to be filmed, then please sit in the back behind the camera. But, uh, and if you do want to be filmed, just come up here. And have fun. Applause, applause, applause. More, applause. more. More. Yes, yes. yes. Thank you. Give me everything. My name is Chantal, and I am delighted to be with you this evening. With me tonight, I have my significantly older sister. Younger. Brunhilde the Viking. Well. Tonight, we are going to introduce you to the ancient art of drag. And as a disclaimer, I have been drinking since 11 this morning. So I can barely remember my name. I can't feel my childhood and I like Brunhilde. So that's usually a really bad sign and or a good sign. But I love you, sister. Oh, you look younger. Thank you. Anyway, before we start with the workshop, I have some questions. Brunhilde. Yes. Can you tell us a bit about how you got into drag? That's a fun story, actually, because I was on a date with a guy, and he lived in this witchy cottage with, like, five other people. It was like a gangbang situation, I thought, when I got Ooh. out there. Turns out it was not. It was just, like, a roomy situation, so I was really, like, not that happy. And then, they, then there was, like, this woman there and she was like this woman she was large she was in charge of the place you could tell and she had this really witchy hair going on and she looked at me with a tarot card and she said have you ever have you ever have you ever wanted to be a woman and i said yes so she said oh Try to do drag, honey. I think you would be good at it. And turns out Ooh. I'm not. But I'm still doing it. So that's how I got. How, how did it start for you? It's funny that you are... I mean, can I, I think you look wonderful tonight. Thank you. Can we get a round of applause for Brunhilde? And l let me just... This fiber, though... It's polyester. It's polyester. Don't get near her with a cigarette. She's highly flammable tonight. People say, woof, woof, and then I'm gone. Yeah. Anyway. Like the wicked west of the west. Yeah. Anyway, let me tell you the story about how I got into drag. Believe it or not, I share my body with a beige 35-year-old man. No. Yeah. And about seven years ago, I attended a party in a community of queers. I had some friends that lived out in Vestapo and we were having a party and that night we got really drunk and all of a sudden we saw some stilettos lying around and I put on a pair of fabulous leopard platforms and I started, you know, walking around. We did a walk off. I saw shade, I saw shade and all of a sudden, I don't know how it happened, I was wearing a very tasteful cocktail dress. Cock. Tail. Yeah. Cocktail Cock. dress. Um, and a tired wig. Just like now. A sun hat. And all of a sudden there was some makeup on the table and I started doing my makeup. And as a child I was pretty creative. I, I know how to draw. So I drew a face on top of my own face. And all of a sudden I said, how do you know how to do makeup? I was like, I don't know anything about makeup. I just drew a face on top of my own. And they were like, you look like the heiress to the Burj Al Arab. And then I just said, mais oui, I am. And they were like, why do you have a French accent? And I said, well, I studied in Paris for three weeks. And that is how Chantal Al Arab was born. It was a relatively painless childbirth. My drag mother did not need stitches afterwards. 
good for her. And I have been st strutting my stuff for about seven years now. And look at that. I went from 35-year-old average gentleman to 43-year-old recently divorced lady who's ready to date again. I know. A round of applause, please. Tonight, we are going to bend gender. We are going to introduce you all to the ancient art of drag. And in order to do that, we need a volunteer because, I mean, we already beat our mugs, so we can't beat our own mugs anymore. So we need a volunteer. Victim. A victim? Someone? Ooh. We have someone down there. Just, can you pull down the mask? I just want to see what we have to work with. Oh yeah, there's a lot of face in that. I think that's a good candidate. Would you join us up here, please? And we have, of course, made our corona measurements. So Brunhilde, could you put on a mask, please? And we're go I like to keep it off. We're just going to sanitize you. Here you go. So we're going to sanitize your hand. What's your name, darling? Lauritz. Sure. <laughs> this is Lauritz. And Lauritz, if you could have a seat here. Sorry, I've, I've been drinking. <laughs> Why La is this so difficult to open? She's Honey. pretty, but she's not very smart. I'm not good with my fingers, but my mouth do the job. Here you go. Someone made a mess. Just so, call me doctor. Lauritz, have you ever done drag before? No. How are you feeling right now? Excited. But I can tell. So excited. You, you just can't hide it. Are you about to lose control? Do you think you like it? Yeah, I will like it. You will like it. Anyway, Lauritz, we are now going tr to transform you from that. this, <laughs> this situation. No, you're, you're adorable. I love you to bits and pieces. We are going to transform you from this situation to a beautiful drag queen with the use of makeup. And Copenhagen Pride has kindly provided us with... <laughs> they have kindly provided us with a beauty blender, some setting powder, very cheap contouring, three brushes, because apparently that's all you need, and an eyeshadow palette, and some minuscule lashes. I mean, these are smaller than the ones I use under my eye. These are smaller than the ones I use around my anus. Thank you, Copenhagen Pride, for, I mean, I consider this a hate crime. <laughs> they're, not, they're not even, anyway, don't worry, no, it's, we got you, we'll make you pretty, don't you worry. Brunhilde. Yeah, we need to move, but thank God we have so many face masks, so we can, we can work our magic. And Brunhilde, while you are securing Laurit's hair, can you tell me, what is the first step of doing drag? Suffering. Suffering. Once you have suffered, what is the next step? A foundation. Foundation. You, you have to make sure that you have a good base. And today we're using a liquid foundation. You also have the option of using a stick foundation. Some people prefer to pick a stick foundation that matches your skin tone. How do you feel about that, Brunhilde? I like to use the TV white paint stick. Yeah, forget about everything called matching your skin tone. This is drag. You don't want to look natural, you want to look pretty. Just don't do blackface, thank you. Just don't do blackface, that's kind of problematic. You can do everything you want to do more or less, apart from blackface. Anyway, 
Brunhilde, I'm curious. I can see that you are using a generous amount of foundation. Is there such a thing as too much foundation? No. Once it starts to look like clay, add more. That is a very good tip, my friends. There's no such thing as using too much foundation. If you start looking like clay, it's because you have not added enough. Just pile it. Don't be afraid of the foundation. The foundation is your friend. Yeah? Any questions at this time? Did anyone bring makeup to play along? No? How sad. You did? You know, don't be afraid of the makeup. If you start looking like clay, it's because you haven't added enough. So, never be afraid of the makeup. You just sort of scatter it across your face carelessly. And I can see that Brunhilde is currently bouncing the beauty blender on Laurit's face. The reason why we wear foundation is to create a blank canvas. We want to smooth out all the imperfections in the skin. And the best way you can do that is by caking on foundation. There's no such thing as too much foundation. You want to make sure that all natural features have been removed. Today we're using a liquid foundation. There's also stick foundation, as I mentioned. If you want to use stick foundation, I would recommend that you use a really heavy stick foundation with a lot of pigment. Because once you have added the stick foundation, you want to blend it into your skin and you really sort of want to massage it into your pores. And there's no such thing as wearing too much stick foundation. Just like that. Okay, I can see that we have moved along. We have now created a blank canvas. We have removed all the imperfections on your face. You look so much better, by the way. And the next step, Brunhilde, what are you doing now? Powder. Powder. Do you need help with that? Yes. I'm a helpless baby. Because I can't do anything. Oh, got it, got it. Here, got it. I was about to get desperate. Here we go. We have powder. And, and what do you want to do with that powder? Spank it. Twist it. And blow it. No. No. I want to put it all over his face, or their face, sorry. We're going gender neutral here today. Oh yeah, we didn't ask you, what is your preferred pronoun? Uh, he, him. He, him, or they, they, them. Fabulous. So now we're adding powder. You add powder to the blank canvas you have created to set the foundation. Most foundations are oil-based, which means that they will move around on your skin until you set them. So you want to press a lot of powder into the foundation. And Brunhilde, can you apply too much powder? Now we come back to the clay. Because if it doesn't look like clay, add more. Exactly. Never be afraid, afraid of the powder. The powder is your friend, and you really want to press the powder into your face. If you start looking like clay, it's because you have not added enough powder. So you just want to pile on the powder. Never be afraid of the powder. And I can see already here, you can see that we've taken the foundation. It used to look oily. Now we have added a white setting powder on top of the foundation and already now it looks less oily and you can really tell how the pores have been diminished and how the surface of their skin looks so much smoother and more clay-like. Wonderful. And now something is happening. Yeah, do you need help darling? She's pretty but she's not very smart. Round of applause. More. Got it. 
Got it. So, the step we're at right now is known as contouring. And a lot of people think that the Kardashians originated contouring. Cute, right? They didn't. Contouring is an ancient art invented by drag queens. And, con and contouring is the way, or it's the art of sculpting the face using light and darkness. And if you look at what Brunhilde is currently doing, if you step out here, Brunhilde is currently carving in a new cheekbone because Lauritz didn't really have cheekbones before. But who cares? There's no problem in this world that cannot be s solved with a good contouring palette. So we're now going to carve some new cheekbones onto your face. I also usually recommend that you draw a halo, sort of a beige rainbow on the forehead to make the forehead seem smaller, that you carve out the jawline just to create a desired shape. You may even want to contour under your lip right here to give the illusion of a more plump lip. And you may also want to put some dark shadows under your nose that gives the illusion of a little button nose. That is contouring. With contouring comes highlighting. Highlighting is the technique where you add light to the parts of the face you want to enhance. That could be the very middle of the forehead if you want to create the illusion of a tiny little doll's head. It could be the tip and the bridge of the nose. It could be the cubits bow, which is right over your lips, the tip of your chin, and right under the contour line of your cheekbones. When you do that, when you work with light and shadow, you enhance the parts of the face you want to draw forward, and with the darkness, you make certain parts seem smaller, almost like they're sunken in. And if you look at Lauritz, you can already see now that, I mean, had you been a horse, we would have had you put down at this point. But you're not, so we'll just keep on painting. You can see how the cheekbones have been carved and how Brunhilde is now starting to add a bit of lightness, some light concealer to the cheekbones. I'm pretty sure we'll get a bit moving from the cheekbone in towards the nose. If you put it up on the side of the nose, you'll actually make the nose seem a bit smaller. We'll get a bit in the center of the forehead, right on the cubit's bow and on the chin and right under the crease in the cheekbones. And through that, we'll create, we will create the illusion of a tiny little doll's head on Lauritz. And now it's, I'm really curious, how are you feeling at this time? Still very excited. You're still really excited. And, and you can't hide it, I can tell. <laughs> about to lose control. And you should have used a bathroom before coming here if you're about to lose control because I'm not cleaning up after you. Anyway, I must say, you look lovely. Lovelier than ever. It's very interesting. Because it seems like what we're doing at the moment is that we're just applying a bit of makeup to Lauritz's tiny little visage. But it's so much more because drag is not just makeup and it's not just fashion. It is also working with your character and it is pushing up against the boundaries of society. Wouldn't you say so, Brunhilde? Can I get the question again? It wasn't a question, it was a statement that drag is much more than makeup and fashion. Yeah, it's also bad posture. In Brunhilde's case, drag is also bad posture. Well, I would say it in a different way. I'm going to sit down because this is where it gets serious. I'm not going to do a Britney. I'll do a Liza. I'll cross my ankles like a real woman and I'll sit. I'll get eye contact with at least two of you. Thank God I'm cross-eyed because I'll catch a, a couple of you. No. If you ask me, 
Drag is everyday activism. Drag is activism in high heels because drag is a way of entering a space and just by being in the space, you command a gaze. By stepping into a space, people will look at you and people will question gender. Sometimes being there is enough to make a difference. And I know that because every time, I, every time I enter the world like this, I create reactions in the people around me. They can be positive. People will look at me, they'll smile, they'll give me compliments, they'll tell me I look fabulous, I'll tell them that I just had my hair did. And they can be negative. Just by looking like this, walking down the street, I've had bottles thrown at me. I've had people spitting at me. I've had people pushing me, shouting at me. And that shows me that this is not just a thin layer of nylon that I've put on my body. This is not just a cheap shake and go wig. And this is not just a bit of mineral powder and lip gloss that I've ate. I'm naturally beauty beautiful. So I don't need more than some mineral powder. Anyway, but it shows me that drag is more than just a costume. Drag is a way of pushing the boundaries of society. Drag is also a way of questioning gender. And it's a way of questioning sex. Because when I put this on, when I put this surface on my body, automatically you start questioning what is underneath. Because it's pretty clear, me sitting like this, I, I don't think I have to tell any of you, of you I was not born in a female body. I was not assigned female at birth. And when I go back home, I take off my wig, I take off my dress, I take off my tits, I take off my pads, I take off my stockings, all five pairs, I take off my corset, I take off my makeup, and underneath you'll find a pretty average 35-year-old man. I said it. 29-year-old man. <laughs> can, can, can we edit? Thank you. Good. You'll see a pretty average 29-year-old man underneath all of this. When you look at that man, who you know is underneath this very thin layer of nylon polyester and sequins, you're also automatic, automatically asking me, what is underneath that body? Who is the person inside? And is what you see on the outside the same as what you see on the, outs on the inside? So drag has this dual questioning to it. You question the outside as well as the inside. And this very thin layer of nylon becomes that space in which these questions happen. And I think that's why people are so afraid of drag. That is the only answer I have to myself. The reason why I provoke such strong reactions when I enter a space is because people ask questions and people are confused. And perhaps because, because people are made aware of the fact that gender is a performance. I make it so clear that gender is performative. Gender is not who I am. It is something I do. It is a role I perform, just like everyone else. Very often people are like, I don't get it. And if, if I meet someone who's like, you know, a cis heterosexual, I usually say, have you ever been to the supermarket and looked around at other people and then thought to yourself, do, do they all know that I'm pretending to be a grown up? Because most people have been in that situation either at work or at the supermarket where you look around at everyone and you're like, no one knows, but I'm just pretending to be a grown-up. This is what I'm currently doing, just with the gender role. I'm not trying to emulate the sex female. I'm emulating a very specific gender role. By doing that, I get to question, we could say everyday femininity, but I very much also get to question my own masculinity. Let's just move on to Brunhilde. So Brunhilde, I'm very curious, how is it going up here? Fine. I can see that you've started doing the eyes. 
Yeah, I would say the eyes are difficult because... Oh, oh thank you. I would say the eyes is like, you know, the windows to the soul, so they're quite important. Um, I like to shave off my eyebrows because it gives me a really clean plate. But since I wouldn't violate Lauritz here, I chose to keep his eyebrows. And we have a quick way of like making a cut crease, which is like a work in progress, but you know, it's getting there. So what you want to do is that you want to take where your eyebrow is, or was in my case, and just draw on a new eyelid where that was. And just go for it. Just go crazy, go bald, use some glitter. Do we have a glitter? Uh, no. We should have asked for glitter, goddammit. They couldn't afford that. I would usually say glitter is a... That's just a highlighter, darling. Glitter is a very good tool to have. I mean, if you have a hump, put some glitter on it. If you have a bad day, put some glitter on it. If you have some childhood trauma, put some glitter on it. If you have a big spot on your face, put some glitter on it. Oh, we have some glitter, thank God. I'm just going to return to sort of the question of brows because, oh, look at me dancing away. Brows, um, that is one of the challenges that you very often face when doing drag, especially if you're trying to feminize a male face. Very often a male face has been exposed to testosterone, which means that the brows became very, or become very sort of heavy and protruding, and you'll very often see the lips becoming smaller and so on. And what you're interested in doing is creating more real estate over the eye. So what you can do is you can shave off the brow, that's what Brunhilde does, or you can use different techniques to cover your eyebrows. Some people prefer using a glue stick, and that's simply just going over your eyebrows first against the grain of the hair and then with the grain of the hair, and then you sort of smooth out the eyebrows and glue them to the face. You can also use prosate, which is um, a glue used for prosthetics. You can use um, mastic. You can use different kinds of glue and simply glue your eyebrows to your face. I would say the easiest thing you can do is just shave off your brows. That will perhaps affect your everyday life if you don't do drag every day. But that does create the most smooth canvas. But once you have, you could say, gotten rid of your eyebrows, you can start sort of creating a new eye, building a new crease. And in Lauert's case, we're just reusing the eyebrows and creating a globe line. That is the crease that you'd usually have over the eye. And we're doing that to create more space we can paint on. Because what we're interested in is getting as much real estate as possible so we can add some color. Because no one wants a tiny little eye. I mean, as you can see, I go for a very subtle eye because I, w I went for a day look today. So I'm only wearing six pairs of lashes. But I wanted something subtle and understated. But now we're doing real drag, so we want a lot of space to paint on. And I can see you're working in, in tones of red. Um, so, Lauritz, do you feel like an autumn girl? Uh, yeah. Sure. Yes, I can tell. An autumn child. Paprika. Cayenne curry, a, a real autumn child. Maybe I'll, I'll just get a wireless microphone because this one is difficult. So, while Brunhilde is painting Lauritz, I'll go down to the chair where I do serious talk. I'll sit down, I'll cross my ankles like a real lady, and I'll keep on talking about performance. As I said, Drag is a way of interrogating and questioning gender. But to quite a few drag queens, you'll also hear them talking about drag as a form of therapy. I have many drag um, sisters and brothers who have discovered things about themselves by doing drag. I mean, drag is not just superficial. It's not just surface. It is actually working with what is on the inside. For instance, I have several friends who, through drag, discovered that they were trans. By going into a different role, they realized that at birth, they had been put into the wrong role, and all of a sudden, 
they started approaching something that was so much more authentic to themselves. I'm not trans. However, I also find drag very therapeutic myself. For me, drag has been a way of working with shame. I think a lot of young queer children growing up learn to be ashamed of the way they behave. They very quickly realize, or I very quickly re realized, that I did things that were wrong in the eyes of the grown-ups. The way I sat in a chair as a little boy, I was once a little boy, I would cross my legs. That's not how a little boy is supposed to sit. A little boy is supposed to sit like this. But if I do that, you can see my peach. And that's extra. But very quickly, very quickly as children, we learn how to behave in a certain way. We learn that little boys sit like that and little girls sit like this. When you look at your nails, if you're a boy, you look at them at like this. If you're a girl, you look at them like this. And if you're a boy looking at them like this, there must be something wrong with you. It's not necessarily verbalized. It's not like the grown-ups come over to you and tell you that you're doing something wrong. But you can feel it. You can feel it when they look at you. You know that they're looking at you and they're worrying about you. There's clearly something wrong with this child. That child is a bit queer. And then, I mean, you want to fit in. So you start monitoring yourself. You start monitor monitoring every single movement you do to make sure that you please people around you, to make sure that you don't stick out. You make sure that you sit in the right way, that you talk in the right way, that you move in the right way, that you have the right uh, physique. You start going to the gym so you don't look like a little skinny boy, but that you get broad shoulders and so on. When I started doing drag, I started interacting with a part of myself that I had learned to be ashamed of. I started interacting with my own femininity. And I didn't just go into my femininity 100%. I went into it 400%. I went into my own femininity, I embraced it, I overdid it, and I still overdo it. And do you know what I discovered? I discovered that people still like me. There's no reason to hide away my femininity because there's nothing wrong with being feminine, regardless of who you are. So there's no reason for me to hide that away. I can perform it. And when I perform it, 400% people like me. And when I go back to being my boy drag, I just have to perform it 100% or I don't have to monitor myself. And all of a sudden I've discovered that people like me, even though I'm an effeminate man. Drag for me became a way of embracing my own femininity, not being ashamed of it and even being proud of it. And that is very meaningful to me. I'm just going to go up to Brunhilde and see we're now doing some detail work. I can see we're adding the brows. And usually I would say when doing brows, they don't necessarily have to be sisters. Just as long as they're related, you know, there might be a third cousin, fourth cousin, something out there. Just as long as, you know, the mothers know each other, then we're good. <laughs> or it could be two girls who went to school together. I mean, don't fuss too much about the brows as long as they're there, and if they're not there, you know what, it'll all work out. This is your fantasy, never let anyone dictate how you do drag. That is the next thing I would like to talk about. Because another thing I have discovered by doing drag is the way that femininity is policed. It's quite interesting because one would think that as someone who usually travels the world in the body of a gay male, I should be woke. I should understand what it's like. But it wasn't until I started doing drag that I understood what the loss of male privilege is. When I started doing drag, all of a sudden people had a lot of opinions about the way my body was in the world. Strangers, people I had never met, would, co would come up to me and they would start commenting on my body. Your arms are very hairy. 
if you shaved your arms, you would look more fishy. Excuse, I didn't ask for their opinion. Excuse me? Did I, did I ask for your opinion? I don't think so. But if you shaved your arms, you'd look more fishy. Who said I'm trying to look fishy? This is my fantasy. I have invited you to look at me. I mean, it's so interesting that all of a sudden people start, I have strangers coming up to me, touching my body without asking. They'll start touching me. They'll ask me, are your boobs real? Excuse me? Have we been introduced? Do I know your name? Have you bought me a cocktail? What gives you the right to ask me that question? Are your boobs real? Or do you have a penis or a vagina? Are we going home together? Is, is it relevant? I would never, I would never have the audacity to go up to a complete stranger and ask them what their genitals look like. I would never comment on the way someone else's body presented itself in the world to their face. Go up and say, if you did this and that to your body, you would be so much prettier. And it's most likely because I've tried it on my own body now. Until I started doing drag, I had never experienced that other people had an opinion about my body. And for those of you who live the, your lives in a female body and go out in the world in a female body, this sounds pretty mundane and everyday. I'm pretty sure that all of you have experienced that other people had an opinion about your bodies, that your bodies were too big, too small, dressed in the right way, you look pretty, or dressed in the wrong way. If you dressed a bit differently, you would be prettier. That I did not experience until I started doing drag. And that to me has been so meaningful. It has taught me so much about how I interact with other people, how I approach the world. It has also really been a humbling experience because it has made me realize that I actually have the privilege of taking this off. To me, it's a costume. I can take off Chantal. I can put the wig on a stand. I can put the dress on a hanger. I can take the tits off and put them in a box. And then I'll walk, I'll walk down the street looking like a dude and no one will... I'll remove my makeup first, of course. But I actually look like a dude when I remove my makeup. I look pretty middle of the road, pretty average. No one knows I'm there. No one has an opinion about my body. No one shouts at me. No one throws stuff at me. No one spits at me. That's a pretty humbling experience because I have trans brothers and sisters who don't have that privilege. For them, being presented to the world as male or female or non-binary is a matter of life and death. For them, it's not a luxury. For them, it's not a costume. For them, it is life. And that has been a very humbling experience because sometimes I get that very humbling experience of walking from here to a taxi being afraid that people will throw something at me, that people will spit at me, shout at me, or push me. But I don't have to live with that every single day. So drag for me is not just therapy. It has also been a way of putting myself in someone else's place, realizing how dangerous the world out there can be if you don't fix in or if you don't fit into the boxes. And it has also made me realize why there's a need for gay pride and why we keep fighting. It's not necessarily for me when I take this off. No one notices me. But as soon as I look like this, I realize why there's a need for this Pride Week. And we're really starting to feel the fantasy uh, uh, up here. Lawitz, how are you feeling? I'm looking forward to seeing how I look. Yeah, I would be very nervous <laughs> if I were you. I mean, it's a look, to say the least. You look very severe. Um, Lawitz, have you been thinking about a name? No. You haven't. Interesting. I think the next topic of the evening should be how do you pick the right name? 
And Brunhilde, I'm curious to know, how did you come up with your drag name? That's funny you're going to ask that. My name, Brunhilde, actually comes from the Norse mythology, which was one of the Valkyrias, you know, one of Odin's bitches. She's like this main hoe, and she's like, she takes the intestines of men onto her spear before she goes into war. And I was like, that's the woman I associate with. So I was just really like a history nerd, and I was like, I love that name. I'm picking that. Yeah, that's where my drag name comes from. It's funny because I didn't really know that I was Chantal until someone asked me, until that night when I put on a pair of leopard platforms and a very tight wig. I didn't know that I was Chantal until someone said, you look like the heirs to the Burj Al Arab. And I was like, oh, maybe that's my last name. And then I was like, I want my name to be something exclusive, something French, something that sounds like a French luxury prostitute. And I was like, Chantal. Chantal sounds, you know, it was expensive 10 years ago and now it's like, you can get it on sale. And I was like, that's me, Chantal Al-Arab. I dig that. It's exclusive and yet... But there are many ways you can find your drag name. Some people take their own name and they twist it. Some people take a quality they have That could be something they do a lot, something they say a lot. And I really personally like when a drag name has a bit of a pun in it. So when there's something built into a name, something funny. It could be, let's say, Crystal Chandelier. Fabulous drag name. Rose Gold. Fantastic drag name. I mean, there are so many everyday things Every single day I hear things and I'm thinking, that could be a drag name. I mean, Corona. Ms. Corona. Miss Rona? Rona is the perfect drag name, isn't it? It really is. My favorite drag name is Karen from Finance. Karen from Finance. That's a really like, good. That's just amazing, that fucking drag name. There's, there's a, this yeah. Karen from Finance. Karen from <laughs> Finance. There's, there's a wonderful um, queen in New York. Her name is Paige Turner. I mean... What a name. So I really like sort of taking things that, that are funny and sort of taking everyday sentences. And you should start paying attention to it. How many things we listen to every single day and then it's just like, that could be a drag name. Karen from Finance is perhaps not the most obvious of them. But just watching the news, I'm like, Valuta, Valuta. I mean, that could be a drag name. I mentioned Corona. It could be, I mean, different medical terms. Incontinentia, fabulous drag name. Just, I mean, also I would say very often, if there's something that's painful, embrace it. Go into the pain, take it back. Very often when something is painful, it's actually not painful to yourself. It's painful because you know other people are looking at it and because they own the meaning to it. So I would advise you that if you do drag, take what other people define and then take it back and redefine it. That could be your name. It could be a character. It could be something you have learned to be ashamed of. It could be, I talk too much. You know what? Be a gobby queen. Fabulous. It could be, I'm big and voluptuous. You know, bigger is beautiful. Bigger is better. Too much is never enough. It could be, for me, my femininity. I was like, you know what? I'll embrace femininity, and I'll embrace femininity to an extreme. Or growing up, I was quite nerdy. I, I grew up in, in a community where it was actually not appreciated if you were smart. And I was like, you know what? I'll make Chantal smarter than I am myself. Chantal loves to talk about architecture. Chantal loves to talk about philosophy. Chantal loves to talk about psychology and history and economics and so on. Things that the little scared boy who lives inside of Chantal would never talk about. Chantal has become a way for me to take certain things back. Chantal has become my way of defining the truth in the world at a certain time. I mean, we're really 
getting somewhere now. Have you been thinking about a name? No, I can't figure out anything. Maybe your name should be Inge Ting. <laughs> Is that a good name? Inge Ting? Yeah. Yeah. Or do you, do you have a suggestion? I always loved the name Heather Osexual. Like, that just rings Heather Osexual. Hi, my name is Heather Osexual. Heather Osexual. I mean, I always have a list of drag names on my phone because every time I hear a drag name or something that could be a drag name, I write it down because you never know. Let's see if I can get to my, my list of drag names. Let's see. Amber Alert? No. Um, Dina Aids? Oh, that's a bit dark. Silky Smooth? Maybe. Anita Mann? Tequila Mockingbird? India Nile? Gina Tonic? Viagra Falls? Oh, well, this is one of my favorites. Cantina. It could also be, what about Dinamarca? Or maybe Closetta. Let's see, what else do we have? Sterile Meep. Euthanasia. Oh, there's so many good ones. Marilyn Manson. Or Mansion. Or Cantina. Or Ironica. Or Miss Steak. Maybe that's the one. What is this? It is Mistake, ladies and gentlemen, I give you Mistake. That's a good name. Actually, you may be wondering, we're now starting to beat the face, but what about the outfit? What about the outfit? Well, you don't have to go to the store and buy something very expensive. You can actually just look at what you have at home. And let's see, I always have something in my purse to make a costume out of. Let's just see. No. <laughs> this is a very exclusive material that I purchased in Paris. It's called Plastique. <laughs> and you can actually drape a dress from this. Yeah, a lot of people think it has to be very glamorous. You don't have to look as glamorous as I. You can just take this, and then you can start draping it around your little frame. Should I have brought a dress? Is that what you're trying to hint? I mean, it gives you some edge. Yeah, well, I think this is literally, I think, the first look I saw Brunhilde in. How, how are you feeling at this time? Looking forward to see how I look. Yeah, I wouldn't. <laughs> We're now adding the lashes. And, I mean, <laughs> lashes is a bit of an exaggeration. I would say a good trick when you do lashes is don't buy these tiny little beginner's lashes. You want some really long lashes, and I would say don't just wear one pair of lashes. Remember, it's drag. Too much is never enough. I would recommend that you use two or three pairs of lashes. How many are you wearing today? I always say that you need at least five pairs of lashes and a cocktail. That is how I do drag too, but I wear six pairs. I wear three on top and three under my eye because it really makes your eye pop. I mean, never be afraid of the lashes. The eyelashes are your friends. Just stack them on. And there's no such thing as too many lashes. I mean, lashes make you pretty, they give you character, they make you stand out, they give the illusion of having friends and confidence. I mean, there's no such thing as too many lashes. So I'll just drape some more plastic around Lauritz, just to give the illusion of a personality. That, my friends, is called throwing shade. You know what, I really like this look. It's kind of Roman.
Do we have a question from the audience? Yes, please. Let's just get your microphone. I'm bringing a microphone. Can I get sound on the microphone? Can you hear me? There's plenty of sound. Everyone can hear you. Great. I was thinking about mascara. Is it before or after the four pair of lashes or? Whatever you like, honey. Whatever you like. Okay. I personally prefer putting on mascara before I apply my lashes. I put on mascara before and then actually I take a bit of mascara and I glue my, we could say, the bio lashes until my, onto my prosthetic lashes, so onto the fake lashes. So first I put on mascara, then I put on the lashes, and then I actually add a bit more mascara. Never be afraid of the mascara. The mascara is your friend. It makes your eyes pop. Are there any other questions yeah, at this have, time? We have one more over here. Fabulous. I, I have a suggestion for a name because I think Lauritz look is so clean. Maybe Loretta Laundromat. Loretta Laundromat, I like that. How do you feel about that name, Lauritz? Are you a Loretta? Lauritz is scared. Are you afraid? A little bit. You should be. You should be. I mean, you, you look gorgeous. I mean, are, are you starting to feel the fantasy? Yeah, you're starting to feel the fantasy. I am too. I don't even remember what Lawitz looked like before. I'm actually wondering, has anyone in this room ever wanted to do drag? Yeah, there are a few people. There are quite a few of you. It's quite interesting because there's usually this misconception, let's say that bio women cannot do drag. That is an old lie. Anyone can do drag. As RuPaul says, we're born naked, the rest is drag. Maybe you RuPaul isn't the best reference when it comes to bio queens. True. Oh, gosh, shit. <laughs> I forgot. Him. Well, as I usually say, this is your fantasy. You can be whoever you want to be, and you can do it however you want to do it. So anyone can do drag. There are biological women who do female impersonation. There are biological women who do drag. There are trans women who do drag. There are trans men who do drag. There are bio women who do, do drag. Bio men. You know what? Who cares? As long as it's your fantasy and as long as you're feeling the fantasy, you can do it. I'm, I'm just curious to know, how many of you have actually done drag before? Interesting. Could we get some sound here on, on this lovely person? What's your name? Uh, Benny. Benny. Benny yeah. And you've done drag before? Yeah. Sorry? You've done drag before? Yeah. Once. How was it? It was, uh, it was, no, it was, uh, it was quite scary, um, but it was a lot of fun as well. What was so scary about it? Um, well, I'm, naturally, I'm quite introverted. So, you know, to stand on stage and uh, perform is just not something not natural to me. So it was quite scary. But you know what? There isn't nat anything natural about drag. I mean, this is natural nylon. That is the closest you'll get to natural on me today. But you know what? I do it anyway. Sometimes you have to do what you're afraid of and then just embrace it. I mean, when you did it, doing something that felt unnatural to you, did it feel good? It did. Uh, yeah, it, it very much did, yeah. Uh, I feel like I've uh, stepped out on my comfort zone. And can I tell you what my drag name was? Sure. So uh, I'm from Hong Kong, and we have um, a convenience store called Circle K. So it's like there's 7-Eleven in here. So my name is Circle K because I open 24-7. I like that. Can, yeah, let's get a round of applause for Circle K open 20... I mean, open for business, right? Mm. Kind of like my legs, open for business. You had done drag as well. Yes. How was it? When, when did you do it? Um, 
many times, but I more or less stopped doing it about 20 years ago, but I do it occasionally. Why did you stop doing it? I think I overdid it for a time, and then I just grew sick of it. But there is no such thing as overdoing. Too much of a good thing is never enough, darling. Well, I don't know. It, it got boring in the end. I think you did it wrong then. If it got boring, you did it wrong. Kind of like sex. <laughs> you started doing it again, fabulous. Give that a round of applause. <laughs> My goodness. We are starting to see some results up here. We're starting to gather the hair in a little bun. The mug, that is, the face has been beat. It has been painted for the gods, yes. We have some brows, we have some contouring. You can see how the cheekbones have been carved out. We have some lip liner, some gloss in the center to make that lip pop. We have carved underneath the jawline just to make everything stand out a bit. And now we're adding some hair. And I mean, it doesn't have to be fancy. What Brunhilde has chosen here is what I call a shake and go wig. You don't have to think fancy when you do drag. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Maybe. What, what do you have in mind? Ooh, let's try. Okay, this you rarely get to see. Now you're going to witness some magic. Punhild is now removing her lace front. Oh my God, look, she's a man. That's more like it. <laughs> and yeah. Yeah, you should apologize. Apologies, everyone. Apologies, everyone. If any one of you need therapy, there's a tent outside where they'll have counseling after the session. Oh, yeah. I think. <laughs> yeah, should we just pull it forward a bit? So, what. What you're witnessing here is desperation. Um, I really wish I knew what to say, but... <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm bald. I'm not used to working with hair. I mean, that's also a look. I feel like this fantasy is okay. I mean, I'm, I'm feeling the fantasy. You're serving, I don't know... Katy Perry on day five of a seven-day meth trip. I feel maybe this could be Lady Gaga after five strokes. <laughs> we are serving Lady Gaga on crack after five strokes. <laughs> and Lowitz, at this time, did, did we settle on a name? Are you, what is your name? Did, did you decide on a name? No, not really. Oh my God, you're not making it easy for me. <laughs> Bunilda, help me out here. What is the name? Miss Mead. Miss Me? Miss Mead, she loves a hot dog. She loves to go to the Miss grocery store. Miss Mead, are you a Ms. vegetarian? Mead. Oh, she's a vegetarian. Funnier. Just ask for the punchline. Miss Mead, yeah. Oh, she loves, oh, that kind of meat. The man meat. Oh, she's hungry. Oh, she's hungry. Let's just... Um, Chantal, is it now that I'm going to reveal that I actually brought an extra outfit? You did? Yeah. Oh my god, can we see it? Because this isn't really giving me that ooh-ooh-ah uh, fantasy. No. I mean, I think it's cute. It's very sort of... <laughs> it's, it, I think it's very Christian Dior circa 1995. Oh, okay, that's good. Let's just... Um, So I brought a leopard pantsuit for fat people. <laughs> and I think she's going to fit into it. Wonderful. 
Uh, you might need a belt on your titties, but... Oh, that's, that's another good drag tip. Drag There's no belts. outfit in this world that you cannot save with a belt. It could be the most horrible outfit, just add a belt. Works every single time. How's my lipstick, honey? Just add a belt. It's fine. So let's get you out of the plastic. Ooh. And get you into the leopard. Ooh. This is... What is that? It's a <laughs> It's a pen. Yeah. Did you make it yourself? I think it's a very lovely plastic bag. Okay, let's see what's going on here. We're slowly but surely getting into the leopard stretch liuta and it's not stretch. It's not stretch. But I'm, I mean, I can fit into it. If you can fit into it. She can fit into it. Oh yeah, a belt. a belt. There's no outfit in this world you cannot save with a good belt. Yeah. Do we have more belts? Maybe we should just tie a knot in the front. Or maybe, maybe this works. Do, do you need help? Oh, we have a belt. You're running. God, you're so chaotic. I mean, the last time I did a panel with Brunhilde, we're sitting up here talking, 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 and all of a sudden it just goes poof, and Brunhilde is lying on the ground, <laughs> mid-sentence. And she just continues talking while lying on the floor. It was absolutely beautiful. You can see it if you go in on www.copenhagenprideweek2020.dk. Then they will have a replay of Brunhilde falling off her chair in slow motion, and that will be a gif for next year. Okay. Yeah, I, I get it. I mean, I mean, I have like, uh, Maybe we should do a plastic trail. I feel like oh, I feel like this is kind of a Flintstones fantasy going on right now. <laughs> I don't know if I'm the only one seeing it, but maybe it's Wilma after like the second divorce. He's going through something. <laughs> Chantal, please take that off. That's just bad taste. It's plastique. It's plastique. It's a very exclusive material from Paris. 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 Not to con yeah. not to Vecreo. Yeah. Okay, let's take it. You uh, know what? This is working. If maybe we should do a little walk off, or a little. What size shoes do you wear? Oh, <laughs> mine are too big. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> a size forty-two. I mean. <laughs> what I about you? Me forty-four. Oh, it's no, like. Mind. Not in your wildest dream. Yeah, I have Not a match. I have what they call a lady's foot. And Brunhilde has what? A 46? See? Si. Oui. Si. A 46. A 42, uh, that means that you can wear bio women's shoes. Lucky. Bastard. Bastard. You know, if you come with me, and I'll teach you how to strut. Let's say you were on a catwalk. You just walk. You walk, you walk, you walk. You know that no one here can afford you anyway. You stop. You get eye contact with someone. You say, don't look at me, I'm expensive. And then you walk back. And halfway up the catwalk, you stop. You pose. You pose. And then you walk back. And that is how you do a catwalk. So now it's, let's see you. Sissy, that walk. Very... And as I see you walking towards me, your name just came out of nothing. I could tell. 
you're exclusive, you're expensive, you own a hotel, your name is Laura Ritz. <laughs> Laura Ritz, ladies and gentlemen, give her a round of applause. And tell me, Laura, how do you feel? Very good. I would feel very good too if I looked as fabulous as you do right now. Ladies and gentlemen, give her another round of applause. I would also like you to give a round of applause to the beautiful Brunhilde. And then finally, feel free to clap. My name is Chantal Alarab. It has been a pleasure.